Benedict Parish Mission featuring Father John Paul Erickson, a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis, and my good friend that I've known since my first year of seminary, which was at uh, September of 2003. And he made, he made a mention of how I, I introduced him to the world of mixed drinks last night with this, my famous seven, well, I guess it, it wasn't my invention, but seven and sevens. And also, you may be interested to know, I still had my vintage 1974 Buick Century even back then. Actually, I, I bought it in, in April 2002, the same year I started at seminary in Dubuque, and he even drove it um, around the streets of St. Paul, Minneapolis a few times. I trusted him with it, and, and I have all my fenders and everything to show it. And also, the last time I went out to, to a movie was with Father Erickson back in spring of 2006. We caught a movie at the Harmar Theater in St. Paul that I don't think exists anymore, and we saw Mission Impossible Part Two in 2006. So indeed, we, we, we've had lots of, lots of great times together. And um, before I turn the microphone over to Father, just a few little reminders. So I do have the baskets placed throughout church in the chapel, the main entrance and downstairs for any free will offerings because Father drove again tonight to decor from St. Paul in Minneapolis. And you know, anybody who drives know that fuel keeps going up in price. So just to help defray the cost of his expenses. And also, we still have a good supply of St. Joseph Holy Cards at both of the two main entrances. And I also want to especially welcome our confirmation students here tonight. So I'm going to quit gapping and I'll let Father take over from there. So thanks again for coming this evening. Well, thank you, Father and Brother. Uh, my name, again, is Father John Paul Erickson. Grateful to be here with you all. Uh, enjoyed my drive yesterday and enjoy, enjoyed my drive tonight. So even though I cut it kind of close, uh, so I'm sorry for any anxiety caused to your reverend pastor, but grateful to be here in this beautiful church. I don't think I reflected adequately enough last night how really lovely this church is. So uh, it's a delight to be in here. I also want to welcome our confirmation students, or St. Benedict's confirmation students. I hope and pray that something I offer tonight may be of interest and of use to you. Uh, one thing I'd like to say to our young people in particular is something which was very important to me when I was your age, which I'm guessing is somewhere between 8th grade and 12th grade, is that uh, I only had one life. And when I was your age, again, I'm guessing here, my great dream was to play thrash metal drums in a thrash metal band. I, uh, Lars Ulrich, some of you may know who that is, played in a little band called Metallica. He was my great hero, my great hero. Forget about John Paul II, Lars Ulrich, all the way, all the way. And something about that music and about that, um, uh, the idea of getting in a van and driving across the country playing underground rock shows was something pretty exciting to me, but I have found something even more exciting, and that's not the priesthood, that is the Christian way of life. You know, the Christian way of life is presented by many people, many people on, on media, as fundamentally silly, as fundamentally empty, having nothing to offer to young people other than a bunch of rules and regulations. It's not. It's a whole way of life that uh, is powerful and beautiful, and full of adventure. So I hope and pray that some of that can, can be conveyed tonight. But for now, let's all kneel. We'll say a little prayer. Well, my brothers and sisters, our topic tonight, our title is Take Mary into Your Home, St. Joseph and the Call to Christian Community in a Socially Distant and Distancing World. It's my belief, and I think many people would share this, that one of the real struggles of the last two years has been a disintegration of community. 
I don't know about here at St. Benedict's, but certainly up in Transfiguration in beautiful, idyllic Oakdale, Minnesota, one of the challenges has been to get people to come back to volunteer for things, to get people to come back. Now, praise Almighty God in terms of mass attendance, we're doing all right, we're doing okay. But to have even long-standing volunteers to come back and to be together again, that's been a challenge. And there's all kinds of different reasons for that. Some of it perfectly understandable and reasonable, you know? Perhaps there's health concerns. Many times our volunteers are a little bit older and more experienced. And so there might be a, a concern, a health concern that is understandable. But there's also others who have simply walked away. There's others who have simply walked away from not just volunteering, but from the church. Because for a year to a year and a half, however long it's been, the month bleeds into month, uh, people have got along without church. And you come to a point where even though your local bishop may be telling you, get back to church, well, why? I did without it for a year and nothing exploded. <laughs> you know, in fact, I've got more time on Sunday mornings. Why is that so important? Many people can think that. And so we have a, a great challenge as a church. How do we bring people back together as community in this particular time? And to be perfectly honest with you, uh, the bigger part of the presentation is not going to be about offering you particular uh, tactics how to do that. We're all trying to figure that out. I think it's a cultural problem. It's a cultural problem. Already many people were kind of on the margins of church participation, and when you eliminate it for a full year, and again, nothing disastrous seems to happen, uh, that's a hard bridge to cross. So there's, some, there's a lot of very deep work that we have to do as a church to bring people back. I want to talk about more fundamental issues, however, more fundamental issues of community, issues that have existed long before COVID, issues that flow from the fact that we are fallen, that we are broken, and that all of us struggle with sin, which is a dividing thing. Sin divides us. We'll speak about that tonight. We are using as our, our focal point, as our jumping off point, St. Joseph. This is the concluding months of the year of St. Joseph. Pope Francis has called this year uh, a particular saint who's the universal patron of the church. Imagine that, a, a saint who doesn't say a single word is the patron saint of the church because he is the protector of Mary and of Jesus. St. Joseph is the protector and he's the provider and we look to Joseph to protect and to provide for Holy Mother Church, our mother, the church. The church is not simply an institution. It's our mother that provides us life, provides us nourishment, provides us teaching. St. Joseph is found, of course, most prominently in the Gospel of Matthew. And I'd like to begin our presentation by reading once again, as we did last night, uh, the significant passage in which Joseph is found. This is from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took his wife into his home. Last night, we reflected upon that expression, do not be afraid, given to Joseph. Don't be afraid. Do this. And Joseph does it. And we spoke about some of the, for, the, the sources of fear that people grapple with and how we are called to overcome those fears by acknowledging the inordinate loves that cause those fears. For those who were not here last night, the kind of the, the, the biggest part of my talk was trying to make the argument that what we are afraid of flows from 
our experience of something we love being in danger. When we're afraid of something, it's because we perceive that thing as being a danger to something we love, whether it's our body, whether it's our comfort, whether it's the person that we love, whether it's our relationship with God, whether it's a pizza, okay? If we experience the sensation of fear, it's because something that we love is in danger of being taken away, of being blocked from us, whatever it is. And last night we tried to make the case that three fundamental fears, the fear of of being asked to do too much by God, or for that matter by others, the fear of being humiliated, of being thought less of by other human beings, the fear of discomfort, all of these fears come from an inordinate love of something, an inordinate love, a particular love of self, a love of the opinions of others, a love of comfort. One aspect of our talk last night that we did not get to was Joseph specifically. We spoke a lot about inordinate loves, but let's talk about ordinate loves. Let's talk about the love that Joseph had and how that was ordered and how that led to proper fear. So this is a little bit of a little bit of a finishing up of last night. St. Joseph, I would offer, has two fears in his life manifested in this passage that all of us should foster, all of us should pray for, two specific fears. This might strike us as odd to pray that we might be afraid of things. But indeed, I think that this is good and important. First of all, we should pray to be afraid of hurting people, of offending people unnecessarily, of disregarding them. We should pray for a fear of that. Now, it can't lead us not to speak in the face of injustice. We can't be crippled by the desire to always be liked. We spoke about that last night, this fear of this cowardice that comes from, I always want to be liked. No. But there is something to be said for a deep concern about the feelings, about the experiences, and about the well-being of others. It flows from the ordinate love of neighbor. Our ordinate love of neighbor. When we truly are concerned about another person, when we truly love them, we're afraid of hurting them. We're afraid of disappointing them. We're afraid of causing them anxiety. You know, if if we don't experience these sensations, not because of how they will make us feel, but genuinely our own desire for them to be in a place of well-being, if we don't experience that, how is this going to affect the other person? It ain't love. It's not love. If we're not afraid of, in a certain sense, how this will affect them, it's not love. Because real love of neighbor leads to a fear of and a concern of hurting the other. And Joseph has that. We find that in this passage in which he is concerned about the reputation of his beloved. The Blessed Mother is found to be with child before they live together. And Joseph is concerned about hurting her reputation because he actually loves her. And so he wants her well-being, he wants her good. He is concerned about her, not because of what he's going to get, but about her, even devoid of his own relationship with her. We must pray for this kind of love of neighbor which leads to a fear of hurting them, a fear of unnecessarily offending them. Doesn't mean we're not going to offend them, but of unnecessarily offending them. But the other fear that Joseph has that we all should pray for, a real deep fear, is the fear of losing God forever, which is possible. I don't think that we hear about this enough in preaching these days, but hell is a reality. And by the way, hell begins here on earth. It doesn't just begin in some kind of fantasy land with pots full of fire. It begins here on earth. Because hell is fundamentally a life without God. We are devoid, we're we're separated from God. And that can begin here, that begins here. You know, the human person has a body, has an intellect, and has a will. We got a body, that's pretty obvious. We have an intellect, we're able to know things. And we have a will, we're able to, to reach out to something, to desire it to direct ourselves and our actions to getting that thing or to be in relationship with that person. 
the body, the intellect, the will. Well, salvation and damnation both begin in the same place. The will. The will. Are we in union with the Lord? Or are we in union with ourselves and the enemy? As Bob Dylan said, you got to serve Jesus or the devil. There ain't no other option. There ain't no other option. And so we can either choose to will what God wills, or we choose to will what the enemy wills. Who doesn't want us to be happy, doesn't want us to have any kind of peace, wants to rob us of that? It begins in the will. And this is true for heaven and for hell. It starts there in the will. Where are you? Isn't this what God says in creation? Where are you? Where is your heart, your will? So it begins in the will, but then when we die, when we die, and all of us will die, it proceeds to the intellect, our union with God or our separation from God. So for heaven, it's the beatific vision. We see God face to face. For hell, it is eternal darkness. That's a fun, cheery topic tonight, huh? Our intellect is clouded in darkness because we are devoid of the light, who is God himself. And then in the resurrection of the body, when the body is given back to us, whether in this life or in the life, uh, pardon me, in the life to come, whether it's in heaven or in hell, our body will radiate the internal status of our soul. It's why we speak about heaven having different gradations of beauty, because some people are closer to God than others. Now, when we're in heaven, don't get me wrong, we're going to have everything that we want, it's going to be wonderful, it's going to be great. But the Blessed Mother has a greater physical beauty than someone who has sort of walked in the Christian way of life in kind of a mediocre way in this way of life. They're in heaven, praise God for that, but their, bo their bodies are manifesting the interior union of their intellect and their will. All I'm trying to say, all of this is the wind-up pitch to say that hell is possible. And again, you don't got to wait for some fantastical realm with you know, guys with pitchforks, it begins here on earth. Hell begins on earth, but so does heaven. Not just because the pop song says so. Heaven begins on earth. Union of wills with God. And Joseph is afraid of offending God because, and here I speculate, of course, but I think it's a pretty good speculation, he doesn't want to lose that relationship with God. He doesn't want to lose that relationship. And so Joseph, when he hears the command of the angel, he does it. He walks, he wakes up, and he does what is asked of him. He doesn't dilly-dally, he doesn't procrastinate, he does what is asked of him. Because he loves God. Fear flows from love. Fear flows from love. It's a good love, or it's a bad love. Bad love can lead to enslaving fear. We're afraid of, again, being humiliated. We're afraid of losing our comfort. We're afraid of not being in control. But good love leads to noble fear, a fear of offending others unnecessarily, a fear of losing God because of love of God. All right, moving into our subject for tonight, community, community. Brothers and sisters, we as human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. Scripture says this quite clearly. Let us make man in our own image. And the human being... What this means is, is that we're made for communion. We're made to be in relationship with others. And the political philosophers, like Aristotle, like Plato, they knew this very, very well. They speak of the human person as the political animal. Now, that doesn't mean they're the animal that machinates and is Machiavellian and manipulates. We have kind of a, a, a jaundiced view of politics these days. Gee, I wonder why. What this phrase means, the political animal, is we gather together in cities. Politics comes from the Greek word polis, city. We gather together. We're naturally social beings. You see that in the cafeteria, and you see that in the uh, church hall, and you see that on cable channels. We conglomerate together. We go to others. We want to be with others. And when we're not with others, it causes profound damage causes profound damage to ourselves. Isolation is a terrible, awful, foul thing, and it distorts us, and it, it wreaks great havoc upon the human soul and the human spirit because we are made to be with others. Now, the Christian knows why this is. 
Some political philosophers said that we gathered together because of evolution and that when we were Neanderthals, we discovered that if we don't bond together on the campfire, some other clan's gonna come in and kill us, you know? So we gotta come together. So the city or community is a convention. We have to have it because otherwise we're in danger. The Christian doesn't believe that. The Christian believes that the desire to be in communion with others is, flows from our natural makeup. What I mean by that is our nature. We've been made in the image and likeness of a God who is a trinity of persons, the three in one and the one in three. So we cannot not need community. No matter how of much of an introvert you may be, no matter how independent you may conceive of yourself, you need others. How we come into being flows from other people, our relationship with them. Think about that. Who I am is directly connected to and shaped by my relationships with others. My parents growing up, my spouse, my colleagues, they're constantly helping me to become what I am. We do not make ourselves. We are made by community. Now, we as Catholics, we're people of the both and. We're people of the both and. And what does this mean? This means that we believe in a kind of attention Anybody who wants to put Catholic dogma or doctrine into a box that illuminates all other realities, we call that in the business a heretic. Either God is all justice or he's all mercy. Either Jesus is just a great teacher or he's a God who just looks like a human being. Either the church is all divine or all broken. We as Catholics reject this dichotomy. We believe in the both and. Very, very important principle. Both and. And so our desire for community, which comes to us because of how we are made, also struggles with the and of sin. We struggle with the and of sin. So we want to be loved by others. I want to be loved by you. We want them to love us, and we want to love them. We want to know them. At the same time, we see them at some level and treat them oftentimes as a danger or as an object to be manipulated like on a, like on a stage, something to be controlled. This is because of sin, this is because of the fall. We have within ourselves the desire for communion, but also the drawing away that is found right there in the beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis. And so like I did last night, I'd like to go to that story of the fall. Last night we used the, the three attributes of the forbidden fruit to describe pride, uh, vanity, sensuality. But tonight we'd like to speak about some of the consequences of sin and the divisions that the fall is caused within our world, and then we'll focus specifically on the division between persons and how the mass helps draw us together and what the lessons we receive from the mass are. All right. Now, the serpent was the most cunning of all the animals that the Lord God had made. The serpent asked the woman, did God really tell you not to eat from any of the trees in the garden? The woman answered the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, it is only about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden that God said, You shall not eat of it or even touch it, lest you die. But the servant said to the woman, You certainly will not die. No, God knows well that the moment you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like gods who know what is good and what is bad. The interesting point here, one of them, is the devil is sort of telling a truth, isn't he? Because our eyes are open by consuming the fruit. But we don't know evil like God knows it as an absence, we now know it within our bodies. We know it in cancer. We know it in betrayal. We know it in sin. So yes, we will come to know good and evil in our very selves. Not like God, though. That's how the devil works. He tells us half-truths. The woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eyes, and desirable for gaining wisdom, like we talked about last night. So she took some of its fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together 
and made loincloths for themselves. The first division caused by sin, the first division, our point here is to describe the fact that sin causes separation, is the separation between the body and the soul. Between the body and the soul. Now, how do I get that from putting loincloths on your body? As we try to describe last night, the reason why Adam and Eve experience shame when they are naked is because their bodies, they recognize, are no longer completely controlled by their souls. We speak of the pre-fallen man, Adam. This is all speculation, of course, but the, free fall, the pre-fallen man is having what's called integrity. Integrity, not moral integrity, but the integrity of the body and the soul. What the soul tells the body to do, it does. No longer. You know, I can tell myself, driving from here, to beautiful idyllic Oakdale, I will stay awake, I will stay awake, but my body will betray me unless I'm consuming one of Father Hirtius's cups of coffee. I need that. My body is not always an obedient servant of the soul. There's also the element of concupiscence. Our bodies have desires that our souls do not always control and can't always harness in. That's a real challenge and a real suffering for life, concupiscence, this battle between the soul and body. All of it, all of it, is a prelude to the ultimate distinction and divorce between the body and the soul that is death. The very first consequence of sin is death, the divorce of body and soul. When they heard the sound of the Lord God moving about in the garden at the breezy time of the day, The man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord among the trees of the garden. The Lord God then called to the man and asked him, Where are you? Where are you? That's a very deep existential question. It's not a question about geographical location. God is not asking for the coordinates on a a GPS system. He's asking us, as he asks Adam, Where are you? Where is your heart? Where is your heart? Adam answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. So this is the second division of the fall, the second divorce. God and man. We now can become afraid of God. God becomes a a force outside of ourselves that can inflict damage upon us or ask us to do things that we don't want to do. We run from God. This is the very definition of sin. We try to avoid and we hide from him. In some sense, hell is just an eternity hiding from God behind a tree, like a little child trying to hide from its parents. An entire eternity. I will stay here. I will here. The second divorce caused by sin is our separation from God, a divorce from God. Then God asked, Who told you that you were naked? You have eaten then from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat. And here we get to the crux of tonight. The man replied... It's on me. It's my fault. No, he doesn't say that. No, just kidding. The woman whom you put here with me, she gave me fruit from the tree, so I ate it. She made me do it. These hands that are meant to comfort and to console now accuse Eve. Adam, who had said just a couple of lines before, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she is me and I am her, now sees woman and all of the rest of humanity as other, other. She's no longer the one I'm supposed to take care of and walk with. Now she is an adversary. Now she's a source of danger. And here we have the division that we grapple with and wrestle with in our own communities and with sin. Separation. Separation from one another. We forget that we are made of the same flesh and blood, and that we are our brothers and sisters. Now, very quickly, I want to speak here about that fourth division, just real quick. The Lord God then asked the woman, why did you do such a thing? The woman answered, the serpent tricked me into it. Of course, it's always somebody else's fault, right? That's what the, that's the, the, uh, the classic response. Well, it's not my fault. The devil made me do it. So I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you shall be banned from all the animals and from all the wild creatures. On your belly you shall crawl, and dirt shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. You will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. 
To the woman, he said, I will intensify the pangs of your childbearing. In pain shall you bring forth children, yet your urge shall be for your husband, and he shall be your master. Now, I want to speak very briefly about this. Why is it that God, to save us, dies on a cross? Why does he suffer? Why is, for the Christian, redemption always connected to death? Why is it connected to death of self? Why is it connected to blood? Why do, we need a, why do we need a human sacrifice to be saved? And the answer, I think, in a very real way is found right here. Because in a fallen world to love, you must have pain. Or at least, at least, be open to it. If you are not willing to suffer for someone or for something, you don't love it. You might have a crush, you might have warm, fuzzy feelings for the person, but you don't really love them. Real love is found in the willingness to suffer for the other. The image of childbirth being a source of pain is an image of the cross, the cross. Life through death. Beautiful chants and the songs of heaven to the cries of difficulty. But then, to the man, he says, because you listened to your wife and from, ate from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat, cursed be the ground because of you. In toil shall you eat its yield all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you as you eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face shall you get bread to eat. Again, a reminder that only from suffering comes life until you return to the ground from which you were taken. For you are dirt, and unto dirt you shall return." So, how it was supposed to work was the garden was supposed to give to Adam and to Eve everything they needed. They would tend it, they would, they would plow it, and it would cooperate. No longer. No longer. Now nature itself is at odds with the human person. Now, it doesn't always work that way. Driving down here, I, like I said yesterday, I saw perhaps the most beautiful sunset I've ever seen in my life. In my life. And the beautiful fields and surrounding countryside here in Iowa. Reminder to us, it's not all bad. Goodness gracious, it's not all bad. Just like the human person, even though we're inclined to sin, it's not all bad. We have the capacity for greatness and for heroicism. But there is a tension. Because of this tension, we have tsunamis that kill hundreds of thousands of people in a single day. Because of this tension, we have earthquakes that rip apart the world and bring people to their graves. Because of this fall, we have asteroids falling from the sky. Please don't happen tonight, okay? Because of the fall, because of sin, we have a division between man who is meant to be a gardener and nature. Because of this, there's always this struggle between man and nature. It's why we have to build dams. It's why we have to, to build houses to protect ourselves from the weather. It's hard for me to believe that in the Garden of Eden it ever got to 130, okay? I'm just saying. It's hard for me to believe. But because of the fall, we're at this kind of separation from nature. All right. All of that meant to be a big context for that third division between human persons, which community is an attempt to heal, to come together as one to come together as a community. And again, within every human person, there is this tension. We want it, and yet we also rebel against the people that are sitting next to us. We see the other as one like ourselves, to love and to be loved, and yet we also see them at times as an adversary, as an enemy, as someone who can hurt us and can wound us, and we can accuse them of things. I want to speak probably for about the rest of, of this evening, and we will conclude no later than eight, perhaps even a little bit before that, we'll see. I want to speak about the Holy Mass, communion, as an antidote to this uh, desire to separate and to point at each other and to accuse each other and to put each other into boxes. Long before COVID, although I think some of the tensions of COVID have exacerbated it, you had divisions being made, lineups being made. What news channel do you listen to? What news source do you receive your news from? What blogs do you follow? What political candidate do you follow? What kind of, what colored sign do you have in your front yard? 
And all of these divisions, which are again uh, exacerbated and are manipulated by pundits, who I'm convinced don't believe half of the things they even say, and then we got you all divided up, y'all. We got us all divided up. You know, where do you fall? Where, where are you found? What box can I put you in? When we put human beings into boxes, we have already begun to surrender to sin. Sin is not just in the will. It's also in the intellect. When we, how we see each other, how we conceive each other. We can see each other as just a political opinion, as just one uh, we look at one facet of someone's life and we think that we've got them figured out. Terrible. Awful. And we have to fight against that, especially as Catholic Christians. Catholic, of course, means universal. We're a church of all, oh, all types and shapes. We must be bonded together in a desire for holiness and are reaching out for the following of Jesus. But we're not all the same, and our opinions on things will not always be the same, even as there must be unity in certain matters that are very important. The church has always held that the Mass, the Eucharist, is the source and summit of our life, of our way of life. Coming together on Sundays to celebrate the Lord's Day as an act of justice has been with us since the very beginning of the church. We, get, we are the people that gather together on Sundays to break the bread, to hear the reading of the teachings of the apostles, and to be together, to be together. It's been that way since the start. And expressing no commentary upon uh, the policies and protocols of our shepherds, all of which were embraced with a desire for actual human goods, the goods of health, of safety, profound goods, I think that at some point we have to look back and we have to evaluate. Was the decision to separate ourselves from the Eucharistic table, what were the fruits, but also what were some of the challenges that we will have to grapple with for a very long time because to gather together lies at the heart of who we are. And yes, of course, one of the fruits, I think, at least certainly for Transfiguration, my own parish, has been the proliferation of, of online ministry, which has allowed us to reach a whole host of people otherwise that would never enter, would never darken the door of our church. So I'm not bad-mouthing the whole thing, not at all. But it's not the same. It's just not the same because we're bodily beings. Because we're bodily beings. Now, if we're angels, we could worship from a distance. But because we're bodily beings, there's something about the tangible, the touchable, that is critically important. We speak uh, deright, we speak, uh, we speak badly of smells and bells, you know? Um, all of the kind of the, 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 all of the rituals of the Mass. And all of those things are needed and are important because we're bodily beings. Why is there singing at church? Why? Because singing is a bodily thing. It's a bodily thing. So, gathering together in the flesh is critically important. And as we evaluate gathering together or staying apart, we have to weigh some very, very important goods. And again, my hope and my prayer is, is that at some point, we as a church will look back upon this time and evaluate what went well and what did not. Now, the, church, the, the Mass has as its, as its um, kind of, well, as its climax... Communion, Eucharistic communion. Doesn't always include Eucharistic communion, doesn't. But the fullness of what is called full active conscious participation, one of the great expressions of the Second Vatican Council, is in fact found in the worthy reception of Holy Communion. A worthy reception. What I mean by that is an attempt to surrender, an attempt to follow the Lord, an attempt to conform ourselves to the mystery of that host, Little, silent, humble, broken, nourishing for the people of God. That's us. That's supposed to be us. And this reception of communion worthily and well, that's really the, the pinnacle of participation in the Mass. The pinnacle of participation in the Mass. Not the only way, not the only way, but it is in fact the pinnacle of the way. And why do we call it communion? Because it brings us into intimate communion with Jesus and with one another. 
This is one of the, the pieces of Eucharistic piety and devotion that I think that uh, we sometimes forget, those of us on maybe the more traditional side of the spectrum, which decidedly I am, okay? We can forget the, the need for community and the fact that communion is not just communion with God, it's me and Jesus. It's me and Jesus through the medium of the church, the church. In fact, in the earliest years of the church, the phrase Corpus Christi, body of Christ, referred primarily to the church, the church, the assembly of believers. But my brothers and sisters, this communion, as we come forward in the communion line to receive Jesus, we're also joined to one another, and it heals. It heals our divisions. At least that's what it's supposed to do. It's why the church says that those who are guilty of mortal sin should not present themselves for Holy Communion because their life and their interior life is at odds with communion. And this mortal sin can happen in a thousand different ways. It's not just committed by politicians, let me tell you. If we willingly say, no, I will not love as God wants me to love, you shouldn't present yourself for communion. That's a different thing than struggling and falling and getting back up. But if we steadfastly say, no, I will not follow this Lord, then you shouldn't come forward for communion because what communion is is a sign and a strengthening of our union with God and with one another. It's the same thing with confession, by the way. When you go to confession, you're not only confessing to God through the priest, who is a broken human being like you, you're also confessing through the priest to the community. Father Don, Father Erickson, represents the community of believers. One of the reasons why the bishop needs to give the priest faculties to absolve because he is standing as a representative of the community. When we sin, we offend the community, not just God, but also the community. So the reception of Holy Communion in the Mass is a strengthening of a relationship with God and with one another. No me and Jesus for the Catholic. No me and Jesus. It's me and Jesus through the assembly of the faithful. I've been told a number of times by very good and pious ladies, whom I love, by the way, I love, you know, Father, I would love, I would love the Mass more if I could come and church would be empty, <laughs> you know? I could come to church and just be me in the pew and you up the altar. No, no, it doesn't work that way. You're getting something a little bit off here, getting something a little bit off. Is it awkward to gather with fellow human beings? You bet your life it is. They're smelly, they can be uh, distracted, they can have all kinds of problems, they can be willful, but they're your brother and they're your sister. And when you gather together in the Mass, you are bonded together around the table of the Lord who gathers his children together as one. Now, the struggles with community, the struggles with being in relationship with one another, I want to offer four of the chapters, you might say, of the Mass as antidotes, as antidotes of this separation that happens between human beings, COVID or not. I want to speak about the penitential act, the way the Mass begins. I want to speak about the liturgy of the Word. I want to speak about Holy Communion, or rather, beg your pardon, I want to speak about the uh, offertory and the prayer of the faithful and the Eucharistic prayer. And I want to speak about the dismissal, these four things. We've spoken about communion, the reception of communion. is kind of the thing that, that binds us together. But let's talk about four other chapters of the Mass. The penitential act, liturgy of the word, the prayers of the altar, and the dismissal rite. The Mass always begins, with some exceptions, think about a funeral Mass and a, a marriage rite, a marriage Mass, but most Masses that we participate in, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, begin with an acknowledgement of sin. The Mass begins not by saying, hey, look at everybody, I'm right here. All right, Mass can start now. Yeah. No. The Mass begins with an acknowledgement, I am broken. I am broken. I, am, I need to be here, not only as an act of justice to God, but because I need to be healed. Remember who it was in that parable that is justified when they enter the temple. The righteous man who comes right to the front and looks up to God and says, how great God is and how great I am. 
He was not justified. It was rather the sinner in the back of church who bows his head in prayer, beating his breast, acknowledging, I am a sinner. I am broken. I am in need of mercy. One of our previously beloved archbishops in the archdiocese, Archbishop Flynn, would oftentimes begin his masses, his confirmation masses. I served as as, uh, a master of ceremonies for many years in the archdiocese, and so I heard a lot of confirmation homilies, let me tell you, a lot. He would oftentimes begin that penitential act by saying, let us acknowledge our sins, not our spouse's sin, not our child's sin, my sin, my sin. We begin with acknowledgement of my sin. How important that is. I'm sure Father Don has had the experience like me. People can come into confession and they can confess everybody else's sins, number and kind, let me tell you. But their own, it's rather paltry, you know? My spouse does this, my spouse does that. Oh, they make me so angry. Yeah, but, but what do you do? What do you do? Now, how is this connected to our relationship with one another? My brothers and sisters, when we begin our relationship or strive to enter into our relationship with one another, we begin from a place of humility. We begin from a place of openness to what the other has to offer. We begin from a place of acknowledging that maybe the challenges and struggles in this relationship, maybe the tensions there, are not all their fault. That maybe I've got a part to play here. You know, as a pastor, it can be very, very easy for me to think to myself, boy, why aren't the people of God more open to what I'm saying? Don't they know this is pearls, you know? Why aren't more people coming back to Mass? Don't they know what we have here? The fact is, is that I need to be praying more. I need to be celebrating the sacraments better for my own sanctification. I need to seek to strive to empty myself and to realize it's not about me. It's about God's work and God's time and God's way. So I simply would offer that in your own relationships with one another, especially I would offer those on opposite ends of the political spectrum, you begin from a place of humility. You don't begin from a place of, I've got them figured out. If only they would listen to me. We begin from a place of poverty. We begin from a place of neediness. Not neediness, you know, that's, that's uh, um, unhealthy. But a neediness and awareness that, you know what, my perspective on things is limited. And when we discover tension and conflict developing in our relationships or within our parish, or within our diocese, let's first of all check ourselves. Not say, first of all, what's wrong with them. We begin by saying, how can I change? How can I grow? What do I need to repent of in my own life? You know, many, um, this might be a bit too controversial for this evening, but you know, many people can become very, very concerned, as frankly I am, about the public lives of Catholic politicians, and understandably so, absolutely understandably so. But are we praying for them? Are we offering sacrifice for them? Or do we simply see them as a problem to be dealt with? Do we actually love them? Or do we begin by simply putting them into a box? So let's start with our own limitations, our own uh, flesh and bloodness. We begin from a place of humility. The moment we begin to think that we've got all the answers, the moment we begin to think that we are in the right all the time in every matter, divisions can creep in and be exacerbated. The second part of the Mass, the liturgy of the Word. As we proclaim the Word of God in the Mass, it is Jesus himself who reveals himself to his people. The Word of God, Jesus who is the Word of God made flesh. Here I'd like to offer the need to listen to one another, to really listen. And not just what the words that are being said, but truly what is where this is coming from. Where is this person's... Uh, objections coming from or their concerns are coming from what fears do they have what what's their background where where does this fit into their life to listen to one another our holy father pope francis has called us to embrace in this coming couple of years what's called a synod process a synod process this is a, a phrase which means walking together he wants a church which talks to one another which talks to one another 
We have uh, in the archdiocese, maybe this is the same in, in Dubuque here, but certainly in the archdiocese, we got some really, really far extreme churches. We've got churches that are what we call in the business tratty, pretty tratty, you know, very traditional, you might even say traditionalist. And you got parishes that are decidedly not, you know, the opposite extreme as you can possibly imagine. And one of the, one of the challenges is that these communities never actually talk. They got their own things going on, they got their own socials, and they never actually cross the street and talk to one another, let alone the pastors. They just sit in the rectories and gossip about the other guy. You know, that's what we do. But we have to actually listen to one another and encounter one another. So it's very, very important that uh, in our engagement with one another, apart from political matters, in our families, in our marriages, we listen. You know, over and over again, one of the, one of the uh, consistent recommendations for marriage counseling, of course, is communication. And communication is a two-way street. You've got to listen to the other person. This is true just in our daily life, which, of course, means that we have to think that what they are going to offer is worthwhile, which requires love. So in this age in which we are so surrounded by noise, noise on our phones, I don't just mean, you know, noise like music, I mean noise images and noises like blog posts and noises like whatever else the kids are looking at these days, which make us less able to really listen to one another, to one another, to hear one another. What is this person truly wanting, which is always, of course, love. They want love, expressing it in different ways. We have to listen to one another if we want to build up community. All right, I'm looking at the clock here, so moving on. The third, prayer of the faithful in the Mass. The liturgy of the Eucharist, the, the, the actual words of the Mass, of the Eucharistic prayer, excuse me, all of these things. Prayer, offering up to God our prayers. we got to pray for each other. We have to pray for each other, especially those that we have a particularly hard time with being in community with. We have to pray for one another. You know, in the early years of the church, St. Peter and St. Paul were not lovey-dovey kind of guys. They did not like each other. At least that's one impression one can receive from the Acts of the Apostles. They didn't always get along. They didn't see the same issue through the same lens. And even St. Paul says that he confronts Peter to his face in the midst of the assembly. Boy, that must have been an awkward night, huh? Peter and Paul don't agree with each other all the time, but they prayed for each other and they loved each other. They prayed for each other. My brothers and sisters, in our communities, whether it's our families, whether it's our parish, whether it's our diocese, we have to pray for one another. We have to bring the intentions and the needs of the other person to God, and that will strengthen our communion with them. It's not going to solve all the problems, no. It's not going to make us best friends, no. But it will open up our heart to real communion. One of the aspects of forgiveness, we're called to forgive our enemies. This is one of the it's one of the non-negotiables of the Christian way of life. One of the non-negotiables of salvation. You have to forgive people. And one of the, the ingredients of forgiveness, it seems to me, is praying for the other person. You pray for the offender. And not, I hope and pray that they know what a jerk they've been. We pray that they might be saved. We pray that they might know God's love. We pray for the other person. The other ingredient is we let go of vengeance. Vengeance, which, by the way, is different than a desire for justice. Justice is A-OK. -okay. It's needed for real reconciliation. But vengeance is the desire to make the other person suffer. We want them to hurt as we have hurt. That is not of God, and that is not allowed for the Christian. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, not yours. But to pray for the other person, this is part of a real community as well. Do we pray for one another? We have a transfiguration. Maybe you've got it here at St. Benedict's. We have part of our bulletin in which we have all kinds of people from our community that are asking for prayers. And I am ashamed to say, I am ashamed to say, I oftentimes simply bowl right through it, you know? 
I go to what the mass intention is. I should be much more attentive to that list of people that I'm called to pray for. When we tell people that we're going to pray for them, do we actually pray for them? I am ashamed to say again, it doesn't always happen for me. And I'm a professional praying person. But it's important. When you say that you're going to pray for someone, you got to pray for them. Build up that community, that communion with the other. Final point, I promise. The Mass ends with the dismissal. Go forth. The Mass is ended. Get out of here. The Latin is ite misa est. Misa, that's the Latin phrase from which Mass comes from. It's also the Latin phrase from which missile comes from, which is shot out. The Mass leads to missionary activity. And part of community is having a common mission, a common goal. And so I encourage us all, especially as members of St. Benedict's, as members of a local diocese, to find and to strive to have that common mission together. Certainly we're joined together by baptism, we're joined together by the grace of God, but we also must be bound together by a common understanding of what we are about, growing in holiness, striving to be holy, and striving to reach out to others, and to bring them the saving love of God. One of the reasons why, I think, many people are not back for Mass these days is because they never experienced that. Or they chose not to embrace it. And I, what I mean by that is not meant to be judgmental. I just simply think it's an objective fact. They didn't see it. They, they didn't see the purpose of it. Why are we gathering together for Mass Sunday after Sunday? It means nothing to me. Nothing. So the part of the problem is us. It's us. Why is there a lack of community in our churches and in our families? Because there's not a common mission, because I have not embraced that mission. In other words, because I'm not holy. Because I'm not holy. I'm part of the problem. And I need to have a greater grasp on what it is that we are doing here. At Transfiguration, we've come up with a, with a we call it the reason for being. Now, you might roll your eyeballs at that. I probably uh, would in other circumstances too. You know, why do churches have to have mission statements? I mean, come on, isn't that like, like the gospel? Isn't the gospel the mission statement, Father? Yes, fair enough. But at the same time, these phrases through discernment can help us gather together and focus our efforts and evaluate. Sometimes one of the challenges of parish life is that everything is allowed. I don't mean like everything in the sanctuary. I mean everything in terms of this group wants to do this, this group wants to do this, this group wants to do this, you got this on Monday night, this on Thursday night, and there's kind of a cacophony of activity. But if there can be a common purpose, that can begin to direct things, and we can march together. So a transfiguration, our reason for being is to bring all those in the East Metro, we're on the east side of St. Paul, to Jesus Christ, the source and summit of our daily and eternal lives. Perfect? No. But it's something. It reminds us of the missionary need of the church. And this is what we want people to buy into, to gather around, and to accept and to live. So there needs to be a common mission. Maybe part of the reason why we're so fragmented is because we don't understand what it is that we're about. What's the purpose of this whole thing? Holiness. And for that idea to grow and to spread, we ourselves must embrace it and strive to be holy. All right, it's 7.58. I'm very uh, committed to ending at 8 o'clock. I haven't spoken, admittedly, a whole heck of a lot about the dude on the front of your holy card, <laughs> Joseph. We use, this as kind, we use Joseph as kind of a jumping-off point for courage and for community. But Joseph is indeed the paragon of both. He's a man of courageous action who hears the will of God and does it. And he's a man of unity, who invites the Blessed Mother into his home. He is not afraid of her. He loves her. He wants her close, as we must strive to want each other close. I hope and I pray that something I said tonight was at least a little bit useful to you all. Grateful to Father Don for the invitation. Allow me to also say that while it is challenging to give talks to confirmation kids, it is even more challenging to give one's talk to a family member. My brother is in the back of the church, okay? That's my brother. That's my brother. So, uh, who's also the DRE down the street, by the way. Um, so, 
Uh, I'll, let, I'll let him give you the, the backstory on his little brother tonight, but let's pray, and then we're going to have a time of Q&A. Nobody's got to stay for it. You don't got to stay for it, but I certainly would be willing to entertain questions, so please kneel.